You know what you're about to listen to? The Coolville Urbanism Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Koval Anderson. This episode is, in a way, a continuation of the previous interview with my go-to guy on sustainability, Canadian author Chris Turner. So often when I record these podcasts, there is a knock-on effect that leads me to another guest. This time, it led me to Berlin to meet with my friend, Belina Raffi. If we need to speak about climate change in a more positive way, which we do, Belina is one of the people on the planet who is forcing the issue and working passionately to do just that. Belina teaches what she calls sustainable stand-up, enabling people through stand-up comedy workshops to try to speak about the serious issue of climate change with humor. How to shine bright, giggly light into the dark crevices of the global climate change narrative in order to more effectively engage our citizens and change behavior and perception. We met in a park in the wedding neighborhood of Berlin. Now, I might need to apologize for the sound in this episode. It was a blustery day, so there is some wind that I couldn't get rid of in editing. Although, perhaps it does add an element of doomsday to this discussion about climate change. Imagine instead an apocalyptic Category 5 superstorm approaching from an unexpected direction for the first time in human history. Or it may just sound like I interviewed Belina in a bag of potato chips. We were also in a park, so there's a lot of birdsong. But hey, maybe it's just the haunting, futuristic echoing of soon-to-be-dead species. The children playing in the background? Yeah, the ghostly voices of happy souls who are, as yet, blissfully unaware that their future was screwed up by old white men in suits. Let's just call it ambient sound design, shall we? All right, let's fun this shit up here, right? How do you describe what you do? What's your elevator pitch? So, <laughs> I, I work with a bunch of sustainability people People want to make the world a better place and I teach them improv and I've been doing that for a while and my latest thing is I noticed that the way they were talking about the stuff that matters uh, was turning everybody off or depressing themselves depressing other people so I brought in a nice form of stand-up comedy so I have a, a, a course called sustainable stand-up I've now run it 30 times across nine countries uh, and it, I love it and it just it's helping each person who goes through it who's never done stand-up before a way of a really compassionate form of uh, it's a compassionate form of comedy and it's how do we get to a place where it's I love myself I love the audience the system silly is where we're trying to get people to instead of the classic sustainability thing of you guys are all doing it wrong or and or we're all going to die now thank you goodbye you know like it's that's how the Al Gore film the first one that I saw I, I was sitting there and that was for me the big shift of, I, I, I sat there at the end, I'm like, I want to get into a Hummer and go shopping. I was totally, my amygdala was on fire because it was, it was this data without narrative other than we're going to die, we're stuffed. And, and I was like, there's got we need to bring a technology, which improv is, of connecting people when they're afraid and making them generous and kind and creative. So that's, that's why I started bringing the, the improv in. And then I'm like, wait, we also have to tackle that communication thing because you can't do that on the one hand and then be really judgy or, you know, um, or kind of dry about the data and not give it a narrative. But if I wanted them to be able to find the narratives or at least the tangential lightness so that they could keep going because they were looking at heavy stuff all the time, climate data or, you know, how destroyed a certain uh, region is in terms of um, the environment. I had a lady who came to my course, she she was doing a PhD on the environmental degradation of a certain area outside of Canberra. And at the end of the course she said, um, every time I would talk about my PhD before the course I'd cry because it was just really overwhelming. And she said the course gave her the ability to find the lightness to, to keep going. And then we did a level two in Melbourne. We were gearing to be part of the uh, Melbourne Fringe Festival, which was like a new level of showing up in the world with this form of comedy. And she went into it and she said, look, I don't want to worry you, but I've just been diagnosed with PTSD. Is it cool that I'm, you know, I just wanted to give you a heads up. And it, for me, it's really counterintuitive that she would choose to do a more intense form of stand-up comedy, which is inherently scary. But the way we're doing it, there's something healing about it. There's something compassionate for self and others that, and people find treasures, ways of holding these scary ideas 
in, in ways that they can cope with instead of just being overwhelmed by it. So I mean, isn't that what humor is, apart from maybe a social bonding mechanism, but it's, in, it's to, to make light of serious situations, tackle the hard things in life by making, by, by, by making light of it. I mean, yeah. in a way, that's just the, 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 the basic function of humor, isn't it? If done well, there's certain humor that destroys. There's certain humor that leaves you... Uh, that either attacks people or the stand-up is attacking themselves. So the whole, like, Hannah Gadsby stuff, one of the things that she brought out was she was tired of the self-deprecating humor that's expected in stand-up. And for me, I'm circumventing that by teaching people how do you get to, I love myself, let's share that, versus anything else. Because a lot of people go negative when they're afraid. And that's another thing, just improv helps you to notice if you're to go positive when you're afraid instead. And I think just in sustainability generally, that that's a really useful mindset to be able to flip. And then when we're talking about it, to not, everybody's gonna go through negative dark periods when they're looking at this stuff. That's not like, that's just kind of normal human behavior. But if you're trying to engage other people to change what they're doing, you can't share that laundry with them. You have to share the gems of sitting in the, in the dark cave, the, pieces of light that you find in that dark cave, share that with them. And then they have a, a chance of thinking about it. And, and what I'm finding is you can say really quite big, heavy stuff uh, in this comedy as long as you, right after, make people laugh about something tangential. If you carry on heavy, 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 people just put up a block to it because they're just, we're all surrounded with, we're all gonna die, it's all, it's hopeless, we're da da da. And, and it feels like with certain groups, it's becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy. Also in sustainability, sometimes you have those people who are like, they get power from the knowledge that we're all going to die. I don't know if you've met those, but it's, it's like <laughs> those people who are like, I know we're all going to die and therefore I'm better than you. It's like some Star Trek it characters, is, right? They feed weird. off your fear exactly. of mortality and they yeah. become stronger. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So, and even, like, I, so I was in the UK during the early transition town movement and... And they were so intense. I was kind of like, if that's what it takes to live, I'd rather die with the happy people out here. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So it's sort of... Also in the activist scene, you have people who... They feel like if they're not showing they're angry, they're not showing that they care. Like it's been fused together. Um, that they have to be on fire angry. But that's not just personally sustainable. And you're not very creative or engaging when you're in that state. So that's the other pleasure with this course is trying to engage people who are that, giving them another way so that they can actually reserve some of their energy so they can discover new things. Because in that, you know, pissed off state, you actually are missing a lot of offers and clues around you because you're just so laser focused on being angry. So all this is well and good. This is why I'm talking to you because you do the thing you do. And I was talking to my friend, Chris Turner, leading writer on sustainability and we touched upon this subject he's done a lot of thinking about it as well um identifying the problem uh bringing sustainability to the people in a different way than the we're gonna die right and the planet is absolutely screwed it's your fault so give us some money you know like (laughs) ding dong you know and door slamming in your face and that's what is cool about this podcast because i'm sitting there spontaneously podcasting with uh with chris and then i'm going oh my god i have to talk to melina about this because awesome. he's identified the issue very eloquently and and has some you know solutions of how to do it better how to approach it better you know not the whole dark narrative but like you know what there's actually stuff you could do regular citizen person yeah. that you know will make you feel good about the planet will help have an impact and you'll save some money you know on your bills or whatever right like he yeah. for him that's like not just the only approach but that's what he talks about and i'm going oh i gotta talk to belina because like you know we gotta, we gotta, you know, totally use humor. Because if we talk about a narrative, man, I mean, the entire time we've been alive, <laughs> you and I, right? I'm not aging you, don't worry. Um, outing your age here on the podcast, but I mean, literally, our entire lifetime, yeah. we grew up with this, right? Yeah. The world's screwed. The world's, you know, it's messed up and pollution and acid rain. Do you remember acid? I miss acid rain. <laughs> I know that. Man. If only we just had acid rain. Where are they now? The people you knew when you were young. Where is acid rain now? God, I hope they're well. You know, Um, 
<laughs> no, seriously, man. Acid rain. That was like just that was yeah. the that was the boogeyman back then. Yeah. At a certain period in my childhood, right? Oh, acid rain. Well, we had the Cold War to deal with. My God, nuclear attack imminent. But yeah, acid rain. I remember that as the first sort of scary thing that I needed to be scared of. Um, and then you know it just continues, right? It's all like the every ozone. Then the ozone was being depleted rapidly. Do you remember that? Like the don't, ozone. Don't yeah. Use hairspray. Yeah. The air, the, yeah. Oh God, the ozone. Yeah, that was the next, right? Um, Okay, what, what's the greatest hits of, uh, of uh, climate change <laughs> fear narrative? We started with acid rain in our lifetime. We moved into the ozone. We said the Cold War, but now we're back to the Cold War as well. Like, it's, it's not just climate. We have so many fear-based things all on at the same time. It is getting very um, overwhelming to, to try to work out how to, how to focus. And that's why I like the Extinction Rebellion people. is like, can we focus on the big one, please? Like, the other stuff we can do later, but like we really need to do this planet one now. I just miss acid rain. <laughs> Man. You realize it didn't actually have acid in it. Yeah. Like, yeah. True that. But still, no, you know, if you, you think about this global narrative, I speak about it in some of my talks as well. Like, you know, you know, it's this global narrative and Chris Turner mentions it as well, you know, pollution, parts per million. And what does that mean? I can probably imagine what it means, but I don't that doesn't mean anything to me. Um, or to the regular citizens of our societies, right? And polar bears 10,000 kilometers away, you know? And then I thought about the ozone layer, right? Wow, yeah. I'm not in Australia. Nowhere near the ozone hole, right? Back then in the, in the 80s, right? Yeah. Um, but acid rain, mm. this is not gonna be about acid rain, this whole <laughs> podcast, I'm, but I'm sentimental. No, but acid rain was like, that could fall on my head, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. And of course, all the, you know, the fear about it, like, oh, is my hair gonna fall out of my skin, whatever, like yeah. cancer and all that. But I mean, it was a, kind of a tangible, uh, uh, marketing um, narrative, right? Well, now you have stuff in pockets. Like now, now what's happening is, if you happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, where they have unprecedented weather, boom, you get it. And you also see how ill-equipped the rescue stuff is, the, the the recovery stuff is. And and for me, it just blows my mind that we're building any new buildings that aren't using the technology that we have to be super sustainable. Like it, there's there's this disconnect and it's sort of like how can we make it sexy and playful and fun to do the stuff that we know we should do, be doing instead of have this finger wagging do you know what i mean mm -hmm. stuff um you know it's get there first like the stuff that we worry about passive house came out and it's sort of like ah but there's no airflow <laughs> so, so like you can joke about it and then if you can joke about it you can fix it there was a fabulous lady who's a sustainability consultant uh, another a different one in melbourne and she was saying you know like oh uh, people come up to her, oh, you're vegetarian, but you have leather shoes, you know, like that. <laughs> and she was saying, why is it that if we're trying to do good in the world, um, but we're morally inconsistent, that's worse than not trying at all. <laughs> do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. And that, that, that's a weird argument. I'd love that she called it out because I'd never heard it put that way before. And I thought it was brilliant. It's like, yes, absolutely. Most people are nowhere near all in, right? And then the people who are just kind of halfway, kind of, you know, like doing a little thing, you know, they get called out by the people who are doing the least. With that, right? So, so we were part of the um, National Sustainable uh, Living Festival and it, we got our sustainable setup got bumped up profile wise and I got this message from some guy who had 25 friends on Facebook and I could tell he was like in the middle of nowhere and he said I don't mean to bother you but and I'm like oh here, here we go <laughs> um, and and he said the image that you use which is of um, somebody wearing Doc Martens on a stage he's like those lights aren't LED lights <laughs> like that was his oh, comment to me. and there is man. this weird phenomenon within sustainability of I'm more I am more sustainable than you. Like we're fighting our yeah, own, which yeah. doesn't make any sense, and and it, it's really irritating. I think people are starting to catch up to that's just irritating, and we're kind of mobilizing against it. But it, it is it is crazy. Like you get you know, like oh you're flying a lot to do the th beautiful things that you're doing, and it's like y yes, and I you know I don't have a car. I fly a lot too. I don't have a car. I I live as sustainably as I can, and there's certain things that. I want to do before I feel I suspect and who knows I really hope I'm wrong but at some point that we will not be able to fly because it's either going to be too expensive or I feel like intuitively that there's going to be this like the door is going to shut and it'll be like okay I, hopefully I'll land where my home is <laughs> during that time um, or somewhere nicer, <laughs> or somewhere nicer. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. but I feel like I'm on a mission to to do the stuff I need to do in person 
as widely as I can before the door shuts. Mm -hmm. And that's also why I've just written a book and why I'm doing more stuff online. But it's sort of like there's certain stuff with connecting that you have to do in person. As ever with this podcast, we, you know, I need to talk to Belina and then, or anybody, and it just morphs into 18 different things. It's, that's the best thing about it. It's so cool. But I mean, the whole flying thing, man, I've been really looking into that. I irritated so many people on my Facebook wall because I said, yeah, if you kind of, you know, remove yourself from the headlines, right? It's a headline society, man. It's like yeah. newsfeed headline. Oh my God, bacon will kill you if you look at it. You know, okay, wait, if you look at the science and you analyze it, you're, you know, and you see how much research was put into it and what university and all the things get different but you look at the whole flying thing because yeah i fly and i mean to do work right yeah. um there's just one graph man it's the best for the for the discussion it's global emissions from 1970 mm -hmm. since 1970 and you have planes trains and ships like yeah. shipping on the bottom of the graph and it's kind of doing this little wavy thing going a little bit up at the end in the 2000s right uh, and then you have the elephant in the room which is this you know black ski slope yeah. <laughs> graph um, <laughs> angle, which is road transport, cars and trucks, most of them in our cities. It's going through the roof yeah. and nobody is talking about that massive elephant in the room, right? I was at the at a side event of the COP21 in, in Paris, right? And, and it was called Development and Climate Days. And what was really weird for me is TTIP, that huge trade um, deal was looming at that point. And that would have, the implications of that would have meant that ski slope that you just talked about would have you know like tripled or whatever and nobody was mentioning it to the and at some point i tweeted like why is nobody mentioning the fact that this is really going to impact everything that we're talking about in this city yeah there's yeah well, the whole the whole stop flying crowd you know uh on the social media it's, it's interesting to consider uh you know it's all coming out of germany and sweden two major car producing nations and <laughs> i'm looking at like the you know the car industry oh my god they are quiet they don't there's not a peep heard out of these people they're going that's pretty awesome people just have to buy cars to get around you know they're they're there in the room without saying a word as they always have been right but how do you rebound being volkswagen though yeah well? i know like right that's, that's, yeah. and i feel so sorry for anybody who actually in that company who thought yeah we're doing this beautiful thing you know what i mean like yeah. what is what a horrible no, I met a woman in, in Spain at some party somewhere, and a German woman from Hamburg who, who worked for the Spanish car company, Seat. Yeah. And she said, oh, what do you do? And I'm going, oh, I do this, you know, I design cities for bikes and infrastructure. And she just sort of went quiet. And she just went, this is a thing, isn't it? I'm going, it's totally a thing. Like yeah. cities around the world, man, public transport and bikes and everything. Oh, I tell my company this, like the company she works for. I say, like, we got to get a game on because, like, you know, and they just don't listen. They're super conservative and stuff. But it was just, I just love that face. She was going, oh, bikes are a thing. God. You know, but like not in any bad way. She yeah, just, yeah, she yeah. sees the future and yeah. her company doesn't. And, you know, I hope she went off and got a different job somewhere else. But it's, you know, yeah. I think if you have any job you do, you try to make it, you know, this is the best job in the world. You know, yeah. <laughs> I'm making cigarettes for children in Cuba. <laughs> it's going to be okay. <laughs> and she's like, I mean, it's I, sustainable packaging. It's sustainable <laughs> packaging. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. I wonder how much of the kind of militancy came as a backlash of the greenwashing stuff that was happening mm. in the 80s and 90s, too, because it was sort of, you know, we're killing, <laughs> we're selling it to children, but our packaging, it, it was kind of that level of. You know, come on, if you look at what's actually happening, what this company is actually doing, or if they have a sustainability department, so like it's not pulled through to the rest of the company. It's like that department does a project a year and then we kill the planet with the rest of the stuff that we're doing, yeah, we yeah. carry on. CSR, like, you know, yeah. we're so sexy, we're so modern, we're so saving the planet. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> in the other room, don't go through that door. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. No, no, yeah. I mean, I always say like driving is the new smoking, right? You know, uh, you know, we don't, engage smokers when we implement anti-smoking laws. We don't say, hey, sit down at the table and tell us what you want. No, we just slam it right on the table. Um, and that's really what we should do with driving. But now I, I smoke like two cigarettes a day. My doctor says that's fine. She's good with that. Like literally, um, she's obviously not an American doctor, but uh, would just like, you know, shoot you in the face if you admitted that, right? But um, AR-15. Yeah, yeah. which is handy. But which one? Because she has two, right? One for the weekends. But you know, you stand on the street and you're smoking and you know, you know, somebody says, oh, it's cigarette smoke. I'm going, it's okay, I don't own a car. Yeah. And it's just hilarious to just, because people are going, what does that have to do? You know, like, it's just so funny to watch their faces. Mm. And go, but I don't own a car, so I don't pollute. You know, I don't, you know, make cities unsafe. I don't uh, kill people. What do you people. do with your butts? Because that's a huge, and, you know, like there's a lot of people just throwing their butts. And yeah. one of the things, my, my French cousin moved to 
Montreal and I love her and she smokes and I used to tease her I'm like you French people you've come to this country and you ruin it with your cigarette butts and it actually she shifted her behavior like like there's a receptacle put it in that instead of having birds like eat it and choked it generally I'll just like you know stub it out make sure it's dead and put it in the garbage yeah. that's that's my See? modus operandi that's super fascinating how we have transformed that narrative like in our lifetime really the past 10 15 years you know did you see the film thank you for smoking no oh, dude you have to see this film it's worth it because because watching how they shifted narrative and took advantage of what was happening how do you i mean how do you make it funny right i mean we need to laugh my god we need to laugh about so many more things than we do now we used to laugh more didn't we man like back in the day you know just 70s and the 80s an old man in a park in berlin back in the day <laughs> when i was young was funny <laughs> You kids today, you don't know funny, you know? One of the taglines I'm tempted to add to the course is, we make vegans nice. Because <laughs> <laughs> we've had a few vegans come through now, and they kind of like, oh, like there's a different way of, you know, approaching yeah. this stuff. So, so one of the, the ways, uh, there was a lady um, who was in the class in Berlin, and she's vegan, and she's like, uh, so I, I don't... Uh, I go to bed early, I don't uh, drink, and I, I don't smoke. I am partying through life. <laughs> Which is, so one of it is like, own your unique weirdness and be proud about it. Don't be, uh, um, don't hide it. And then she said, when, I'm, when I tell people I'm vegan, because of course I do. <laughs> so she's already playing on our stereotype. Mm -hmm. of, she, she said, um, people have one of three reactions, either that's not healthy, or what do you eat, or bacon. <laughs> <laughs> and then she asked the crowd, like, which, which is yours? And everybody in the crowd went, bacon. <laughs> and, and so it's just, it, for me, if I can get them to be funny and adorable and kind up there, people might be tempted to think about it. Versus, if, as you said, if they're being judged, if they're being, you know, like screamed at, it's sort of like, screw you, I'm going to eat meat to spite you because you're an asshole. You know, like, the, I, think, I think the best thing we can do is be play to the top of our intelligence and be endearing and funny. You mentioned Extinction Rebellion, you mentioned, you know, the angry protests, you know, which is nothing new. People mm -hmm. have been angry <laughs> since the beginning of people, right? Yeah. But, uh, and, you know, starting revolutions and whatnot. But I mean, really that narrative, this is what I have a problem with, is, is that angry subculture on the streets trying to get their point across. That does not broadcast well to the regular citizens who, as homo sapiens, are generally conservative. They just want to live a good life. They don't want any boat to be rocking or anything. And then they see these people and they don't, they can't see themselves. There's no mirror image, you know, oh, that guy's just like me, but he's angry and protesting. Come on, kids, let's go join. You know, it's, it's really a hard, uh, a hard thing to do. And I've been very critical, for example, of the critical mass movement in cycling bunch of subcultural cyclists in cities uh, and they go out and they just own the streets and they block the cars and they screw up the traffic and they, this is our right to ride. I get the idea, yeah. right? But they're not winning hearts and minds. Yeah. They are peacocking as a subculture. Look at us. This is, we have, to, we want to be here too. It's our right to be here, right? They're not, they're not encouraging the people, the, you know, the motorists who are blocked from getting home to their families. They're not going to say, you know what? I'm going to just dump my car and join these people. They're so happy and friendly and inclusive. No, it's like the, the opposite. So I, I love Extinction Rebellion. Yeah. I love Extinction Rebellion sort of angle. It's like the, the, the head of it, he's, he's funny. I like this guy. It's still, you know, the Gilets Jaunes in France, it's just angry people in the streets and the general population, man, they're not really getting on board. So, and, and the militant vegans, you know, uh, and the militant anybody's, you know, they, I mean, how do, we, how do you balance the, the, the angry protesting in the streets for an important issue or for not, whatever? And, you know, how do you balance that with, uh, with actually broadcasting a message? Yeah. It, it was a question, actually. <laughs> yes, I'm thinking about it. So I had a weird experience in February where I, I was part of the Sustainable Living Festival, and part of what I was doing was during the during the festival in the day, I had to get to a tent and give a talk about how do we communicate this stuff. And and as you could tell, mine is like, how do you come from a compassionate, solution-oriented space versus the angry space? But to get to the tent where I was giving that talk, um, I had to pass the slalom of incredibly angry activists. <laughs> and it was it was over, they were just shouting. And for me, it was such a loss because it's everybody coming to the Sustainable Living Festival cares already <laughs> like you don't have to scream at us get, show us the beauty of the thing you're trying to create so i get there and then the first thing that happens when i come out of the tent and it was well my talk was well received was this lady's like stop the slaughter of dolphins 
And I just burst out laughing. I'm like, that wasn't me this morning. You know, like, <laughs> I didn't kill a dolphin this morning. <laughs> like, can you not shout at me? You know, the, there's an Elizabeth Kubler-Ross grief curve or change curve, this thing. And, and for me, what's happening is the people in, who are stuck in anger, who are like, their self-worth and everything is coming from, I am angry, look, I am angry, and that proves that I care. The people who are stuck in ang anger are pointing at the people in denial, and they're saying, if you get woke, you could be as angry, fucking angry as we are. And it's like, no, 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 keep going on the curve. Like, you have to, everybody has to do that inner work, but go to the acceptance, building, creativity, let's build the new stuff, what we want. Y you can't woo people from the angry space or the depressed space you know what I mean so so for me that curve is really important of I'm all of the work I'm trying to do is is from that like accept the new reality builds make awesome stuff because again that whole thing from cradle to cradle and I think it said probably way too much but I, I love this line which is do you want your marriage to be less bad or do you want it to be good <laughs> so I love that I'm like <laughs> that is so like yes like and we're almost being by people who are overwhelmed, we're almost being talked into this future we don't want because, of, yeah, it's inevitable, we're all going to die. Uh. When you hear that, they have no energy to change it, and they're also de stealing all the energy of everybody else who wants to do stuff because it just like, you know, like it's almost like an energy vampire thing. And it, it's like, no, 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 talk about it in ways that give people energy, inspiration, and like, right, fuck it, let's do this. Let's change this thing and make it what we want and beautiful and not this romance of, you know, we're going to be Mad Max in two years. Mm. That'd be cool, though, right? <laughs> <laughs> Come on. It was a dystopian future, but it was kind of cool that Mad being Mad Max, driving through the desert and stuff, you know. <laughs> I was a, an angry young man, I think, when I saw that. I'm going, I could totally do that, man. <laughs> um who are the funny comedians out there, like professional comedians, uh, regarding uh, the the important issue of, of climate change and, and behavior change uh, and whatnot? Who, who who do you think about when you think about? Well, I mean, so so the it's interesting. The, my early heroes had an angry edge to them, and, and so I I am inspired by them, but I don't teach what they did. So so George Carlin, Phil Hicks, you know. Um, are fabulous. I love Eddie Izzard. Boy, we as need well. George Carlin right now, man. Well, well, I think I think George needed to rest because <laughs> yeah. he he took on so many issues. Yeah. Like I think there's only so many. I think there's only so much darkness you can transmute into lightness before you're like, you know, my sponge is full. And his his daughter is apparently doing one woman shows that sound awesome. It'd be like to be his daughter. Yeah. Um, Who else? Uh, Katie Goodman. So uh, did this fabulous song, which in it's called I Didn't Fuck It Up and and it's uh, it's just this really lovely sort of I didn't fuck it like it, it's it's this country sort of uh, gentle song that really gets in the psychology of blame and then and then it goes solution oriented which is just delightful and when I saw that it's on YouTube it's had over a million hits when I saw it on YouTube I was the whole project for sustainable stand-up kind of downloaded in my head so and then I got to do a show with her, which was great. So we had a NASA climate scientist, me, Katie Goodman, and a green building expert in a show in Baltimore. Uh, Sounds like a comedy. joke you're starting there. <laughs> yeah, walk into a bar. <laughs> I got a bar, a green building expert, Katie Goodman, and a NASA scientist. <laughs> the yeah. NASA climate scientist. So here, you know, like he's a, he was a carbon expert, and his it, he flies to the Arctic and stuff to do core samples and. To do his job, so we talked about the po the polar bear being the poster animal at that point, and ineffective poster animal, but that's like sustainability at that point, especially it was polar bear. And he had to learn, in his set, he talked about how, you know, he's trying to protect all life on the planet. He had to learn how to kill a polar bear hmm. because they worked out we're tasty and they're hungry. Uh, <laughs> so how do you p kill a polar bear in self-defense, drag its body to the authorities and prove that you weren't trophy hunting? <laughs> Like, that was part of his job of protecting life on the planet. And when you're out in the middle of nowhere, there's no YouTube tutorials. You can, you can, <laughs> exactly. so you how to kill polar bear. <laughs> right. How to drag oh, corpse. Yeah, it's been wheeling the reception. Like <laughs> oh, God. It's getting closer. <laughs> I think I have two bars. <laughs> what about Tim, uh, Tim Minchkin? Oh, yeah. Is he funny? I, I really like him. He has a great song. Actually, it's so interesting. I, the so canvas bags? The canvas bags. I love canvas bags. And one of them, 
So I adore him. I'm putting this out. I adore him. And there's one one version of his canvas bags that I give his homework of. He loses it for a moment because there's a it, we just like what's a beautiful choice? How do you make a beautiful choice in the moment instead of one that drags the energy down? How do you flip it so that people are inspired and it's delightful? And he's he's just singing canvas bags and. And then he goes, clap, you bastards. Excuse me? <laughs> they were with you. What's, why are you being mean to them? <laughs> so I give that for homework just to see what happens. You know, clap, you bastards. That's three words. Yeah. Totally shifts the energy. And he gets it back really quickly. But it's sort of like, why did he... I remember that. that. I remember. I don't See? remember exactly my you know, reaction, but I'm, yeah. well, that was weird. I remember, yeah. I literally think that was kind of a weird thing to do in the middle on that, you know, with the little wind machine you had. You <laughs> exactly. know, yeah. Oh man, seriously, if you haven't seen uh, Tim Minchkin canvas bags, you got to watch it. It's amazing. Minchin. Minchin. Yes. Munchkin. Munchkin. Yeah. <laughs> Minchin. So here, nice town. I just want to add one more thing. So I've been running this for, for several years now. When I bump into students, I actually remember a line from their set. And right, I can't cool. think of any other, I'm, you know, improv workshop, Lord help you, because I'll have, I'm lucky if I remember your face. Yeah. <laughs> but I, so there's something about stand-up that I can remember years later lines from stand-up comedy. So if you fuse that with stuff that matters, you know, and, and give us some, like, you know, pop a recycling thing or something in there and make it funny, there's a higher chance that we'll remember it and we'll act on it. Especially, perhaps, if it's a topic that we're not used to laughing about, whatever, right? I mean, I mean, one of the, like, if I look at, like, bicycle advocacy, which I've been, you know, looking at for over a decade, it's the same messaging techniques as the environmentalists, uh, all formed in the 1970s, unchanged narrative, ride a bike for the planet, ride a bike, save a polar bear, ride a bike, it's good for you, it's all that you know, just go out and do it. It's on you, right? Where I know that you need to build infrastructure and then people will ride and then you can reap the benefits of it, right? But yeah. really the best campaign I've ever seen for promoting cycling was in Malmo in Sweden. And it ran for years, it was so successful. So their goal was to reduce the number of short trips by car in the city, anything under five kilometers. Mm -hmm. You don't really need a car for that was the, what they wanted to reduce, right? Yeah. So they had a great one, it was called No More Ridiculous Car Trips. And <laughs> They didn't even speak to the people riding bikes or anything. They spoke to yeah. the motorists. Yeah. They're going, hey, everybody, write in with your most ridiculous car trip. Like the stupidest thing you do yeah. in, in the city. And the people who won every year, it was hilarious. And you're encouraging the people who kind of know that it's stupid to make fun of their own s stupidity or their, you know, their silly choices, let's call it that. I remember one woman, you know, she backs out of her house onto her one-way street and she backs up the one-way street like 300 meters with her kid in the back, because uh -huh. that's the school. And then she takes her kid to school, and then she drives off to work, right? But like, yeah. she could have gone around the block, but nah, she didn't. And then the dad, the woman writes in, says, my husband, he puts, you know, in the winter, he takes little Magnus or whatever his name is, and you know, it's winter, so, right? Snowsuit on, hat on, gloves on, boots on, walk out to the car, 20 meters, right? <laughs> okay, boots off in the car, right? Open the jacket, take off your hat and gloves, and we sit in the car. And then they drive to the kindergarten. Yeah. Okay, get dressed again, <laughs> you know, schlep into the kindergarten, and then undress again. And she says, the kindergarten's 200 meters from our home, <laughs> right? Like, you know, so that, that family won whatever bikes and stuff from the city of Malmö, right? But that's, that's really, man, it, yeah. it's so irritating to me that I can list on one hand the really cool, effective campaigns for encouraging cycling from, you know, cities or bicycle advocacy groups, man. It's few and far between. It's, it's really, they have inherited uh, the, the same kind of dark narrative or the whole finger wagging, you know, if you don't do this, we're screwed. So you get your ass out on a bike. Um, I don't feel safe on a bike. Doesn't matter. Get out on a bike, right? You know what I mean? Like, and if you could, it, I love the, the campaign you're describing. They, they flipped it and it's sort of, because I think if we're ashamed of something that we're doing, like we, we know it's bad, we know it's not aligned with our values, and yet it's really tasty or whatever it is, like huh. whatever it is, that... It, that if we're worried we're going to get finger wagged, we hide it and we it's frozen then and you not you're not going to bring it up to the light to examine do you want to keep doing it or not you're going to hide it with with the with the comedy what's your silliest thing that's part of what we're doing in the class is like what do you know that's like not aligned <laughs> with where you and how can you get there first and be adorable about it because then that one proves you're human because a lot of sustainability people don't allow for that 
it also gets there before other people get there and you are funny about it. Mm -hmm. You know, like, the, um, uh, we were talking about the, you know, like, oh, uh, somebody coming up to somebody saying, oh, you're vegetarian, but you have leather shoes. <laughs> you know, yeah. It's sort of like, come on, you know, like, uh, why is it that if you, if you try and you're misaligned on something, that's worse than not trying at all. And, and I love the pushback of that, if you can make it adorable. I posted something on Instagram a few months ago. I went to a supermarket and I bought some salads, right? A mix of salads, really cool. You know, two plastic boxes that they, the supermarket puts them in. And I put them, trying to get on my bike, and I'm going, oh my God, the physics of it. It was just like one of these bicycle culture wins. You know, they fit perfectly on my back rack, everything. It was like they were designed for it. And that was the gist of it, right? Oh my God, this is like one of these moments where you high five yourself in a bicycle culture. <laughs> you know, you've got everything on your bike and uh, some dude, from somewhere like not from Denmark, he was going, oh, but those are plastic containers. You know, you should uh, have other containers. And I'm going, you know, and I'm going like, okay, really? Is your glass always half empty, dude? Like, yeah. I live in Denmark, right? And yeah, my supermarket where I buy these salads, which are awesome, they don't have another option for me. Yes, yeah. I said. So you could write to the supermarket chain yeah. here, and I literally gave him the website. <laughs> nice. um, you know, so do that, right? Yeah. And you're not seeing that it's on a bike in one of the world's most sustainable cities where the plastic recycling is well taken care of more than most countries in the world. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. yeah, I don't want, I want to get rid of plastics. I'm looking at my house hardcore at the moment about how I can reduce uh, plastics and whatnot, especially single use. But yeah, I'm just going like, is that what you see, man? You know, and, uh, but you're wearing leather shoes, you know, uh, yeah. <laughs> Ricky Gervais, right? Like, you know, I, I know he's all about animal cruelty. Not, he will. <laughs> <laughs> not for, he's against. Not, yeah, I know, he's all, that's, about, that's his shtick, right? Like, he's, that's his passion, and yeah. um, I dig that and respect that, that's great. I just kind of wish he would just sort of, you know, change tack and come into environmentalism, you know what I mean? That dude. But he talks about the same thing, you know, he tweets something about, look at these dogs being slaughtered in, what, Nanjing, China, or something like that, and somebody uh, tweets back going, what about the children in Syria? Yeah. And he's got <laughs> like it's nothing to do with each other, man. God, yeah, you know. What aboutism is around? A what lot. aboutism? Yeah. Ooh, there's a new one. Yeah. Oh, Americans are so good at isms and ists and labels. And my God. <laughs> but yeah. Oh, then he says like you know it's like you you put up a little sign in the town square, guitar lessons, with, with the little rip off phone numbers, and somebody walks up and sees that and says, I don't want guitar lessons. You know? <laughs> okay, dude. I, know. Yeah. I literally post that clip yeah. to my you know, haters on Twitter and whatnot, you know, what about ism, right? And I'm going, yeah, I think I'll let Ricky Gervais take this one. <laughs> take it away, Ricky. Louis C.K. Mm. does a brilliant thing about the environment, which I used to give as homework, and now I'm sort of like, ah, what do we do? Because it's, it's one of these, I, he did the brilliant thing about, like, if you throw a candy wrapper on the floor and, and sort of made this, you know, then it, it gets collected in a receptacle and then a dolphin wears it as a hat for 10 years. <laughs> like that whole, like, it was such a beautifully designed thing. Oh, yeah, thing. I remember that and one, then yeah. And it becomes, you know, like, do you think God, if you believe God gave you the earth, why would you not have to take care of it? And, and, and so he got at the psychology of, of environmental stuff in a really beautiful way. And now it's sort of like, you know, you dumb shit. Could <laughs> you have kept your your wang in your in your pants? Because now it be because of this course, I, and I still love his brain. And it's awkward because I've had an intense feminist lady going, "Why are you giving any of his stuff as homework?" And so there's another piece where it, it talks about how he constructs a joke, and I haven't found a good alternative. And, and so I kind of do this awkward preamble at the beginning of like, "You don't have to watch it." And depending on the country that I'm teaching in. They're, they're like, yeah, that's fine. And like, oh, we don't care, just show, send us the video. Or like, they think about it. How much, because of that um, nature of people attacking, even those who are in our tribe attacking each other, are we self-censoring a bit because we're afraid? Do you know what I mean? Like, like wh where's the line? And I'm still trying to work out the line with me and being able to point out his fabulous thing on the environment, Louis C.K., and saying, yeah, this is not great behavior. <laughs> and he got caught with, with women, and it was a whole power thing. And it's different than um, Bill Cosby. Like, it's very different behavior. And the, yes, it's bad. And lumping those two together, I find really irritating. Because it's, no, they're, diff they're very different actions that, that those two men got caught doing. And all of that, because I'm doing sustainable setup is anything that makes the world a better place. What's interesting is people bring all sorts of different things in. And it's one of the few forums in sustainability where 
people from very different disciplines come and work with each other together. So, so it, we had a, um, a climate scientist from the Red Cross Climate Center with a materials engineer university student with the a comedian and the green building expert and somebody else. So, so it's very rare, you know, most of the conferences are like, you're a soil expert, go to, you know, again, here's water experts, go over here. And what I love is everybody's kind of mixing together. Mm. And now it's getting to a point where it's like, ah, you're in Denmark and you care about that. You need to meet this lady in Melbourne. So you equip people to make fun of climate change, to talk about it in a, in a humorous way and, and in order to, to broaden the message, in order to reach dark places that have not been reached before with the, the traditional narrative over the past 50 years, right? How do you scale it up? I mean, you know, I'm not going to say it's just a drop in the bucket, but Lena, you know, but I mean, how do we, how, how can we change the entire global narrative? Uh, and how, 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 I mean, you know, a few good comedians and, and, and your amazing work, but man, it's an uphill battle, especially when we're battling now with what about ism and all the isms and ists that uh, you know are being slapped all over the place or the grumpy people who feel powerless in our struggle and are attacking us because we're doing stuff right and getting traction that's the other dispiriting group of <laughs> people how do we scale up so that's a great question um so i just released a book and my next book is going to be sustainable stand-up the one after the I, I just need five five months of doing the current one of Okay, you'll be better at pitching your new book. <laughs> I just published a book, but don't talk about that. It's a book I'm going to write in the future. <laughs> the fuck? Tell me about your new book. <laughs> so, so I just wrote a book called Using Improv to Save the World, and then in parentheses, and me. You are in it, uh, and you were very pivotal at, at kind of... Um, so I let go of having a home completely, and I went all the way around the world, 12 countries in three and a half months, teaching applied improv. And when I was at Michael's house, what happened was... Like the I'm Michael, she's referring to me. Like, I, like I'm not here. It's kind of weird. <laughs> when I went to your house, I don't know. When I was at your house, like the enormity of the holy shit. <laughs> this is, I've just made this choice. So I was a potato at your house for the whole amazing 10 days. You you deserve a knighthood for hosting <laughs> me for that long. But it, but you also like created a space of like... Well, you just started on that then. Unfurled. You you just embarked on the journey then? Yeah, well, um, so I had left Montreal, which I'd been living at for a year, and yeah. and just before was in the UK, but I knew the UK. So Denmark, I hadn't been to Copenhagen ever before, so that was like, it, it shit got real, basically, mm -hmm. when I hit that Copenhagen. And that's why I was like, Jesus Christ. Um, and, and it was... It was the healing space that you held that it was kind of like, okay, I think I can do this. And, and you got me sorted out in lovely ways. And we did workshops yeah. and we did the, and you're like, um, you know, your lovely ex is like, you need to wear these things. <laughs> okay, girl. Oh, yeah, like, she styled you. Yeah, right. Yeah, I yeah, got yeah, styled. Cool. You got, I got photographed. So, so the whole book is about the journey. It, how did I use improv to keep me in a good state in such profound change of, uh, freedom of press index. I track every freedom of press index. Uh, what I had for breakfast, the the environment. I had two natural earthquakes, a sandstorm, civil unrest in different countries, and a lot of good stuff. But it's how to use improv in that profound change. And and then I brought all of that knowledge. And what I've been doing since, since then is using that with Red Cross Climate Center and other groups of like how do we use this in the field to help people change behavior so that because you can't in unprecedented weather you can't go oh last time it rained we did this because that whatever the, this is might kill you you have to do different things and you have to notice that uh, circumstances are different uh, so i've been using improv and then i'm like ah we need we need that lens of lightness in addition to the improv because part of improv is you notice more but if what you notice more is is heavy you also need this practice of finding the light and the dark or you'll go crazy. So that's why I started Sustainable Stand Up, so that's going to be the next book. So Chris Turner had his Geography of Hope in that book he wrote where he traveled the world looking for better solutions. This was your Geography of Joke, maybe. <laughs> um, See what I did there? Yeah. I and if it was Harvey Weinstein, it would be the Geography of Grope. <laughs> yeah, okay, awkward. Uh, awkward? Yeah. <laughs> Hashtag awkward. Hashtag awkward. <laughs> yes. Yeah. All right. No, oh, cool. I know. I, I obviously I know you, <laughs> Jesus. But I mean, I, I forgot that that was at the beginning of that epic yeah. journey yeah. to the end of time and back, <laughs> giggling. Yeah, cool. All the different cultures you're working in. I mean, what, what, you know, where are they most receptive to uh, this? Is Who's so the cool. No. Yeah, no. I want, 
<laughs> no, really that's the Danes. We know that. Um, I don't even need to ask that question. God, no, but like, who's most receptive to like, oh my God, this is so funny. This is cool that we're doing this. Like, this, you know, uh, are there certain uh, cultures where you just feel like they get it, these people, more than maybe another culture where you have to sort of guide them a bit more? It, in the comedy itself or in the show, like in the audience? Do you know what I mean? Because yeah. it's slightly different. Um, Good point, right? Like the people that you work with, that you that you coach, right? Uh, which cultures uh, do you feel like they they see this is great and important or whatever? I don't know. Who, who digs it the most uh, of the people that you train uh, that you coach? It's universally loved <laughs> by people <laughs> coming in. And and, I'll tell you, and and actually, what's interesting is I get a lot of expats, and I think there's something about if you're an expat, you are out of a system, so you see it better. And, and there's something about comedy where if you're making fun of the system, you emotionally have to step out of it to see it. Mm -hmm. So that's also what's healing about it is it, like if we're looking at how we, how our systems respond to sustainability and you're thinking, fuck, this isn't enough. And I'm overwhelmed by that. Just if you step out of it, it's like, oh, thank God. And then you can see it and then you get sucked back into it. Um, in terms of audience, it's been it's been mixed. Australia recently has gone noticeably angrier. So I've been doing stuff in Australia for a while. Up until February, we had sold out kind of everything that we did. It was like, give us more, give us more. This is awesome. And this, during the Sustainable Living Festival, the show sold, but not, it wasn't, you know, like it wasn't selling out, which was odd. It was really hard to fill the public course, which was also odd because we've been we've had a huge profile there but it's almost like they're so on fire angry right now that they can't they're not even up for a different way of being just now and when i came back here i i couldn't move for two weeks i was just like overwhelmed i was just <laughs> burnt out um so so i think it's not effective until they can get out of that mode or at least want to have a different way of being if they're on fire angry, you can't. But it's the ones who are almost like they've been through that phase and they're looking for what happens after that. Get us in there. So are they angry about how Australia is really, you know, the butthole of the environmental movement? Uh, if you look at all the, 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 the major, you know, like the Western countries, I mean, really, I mean, it's a... It's a... Well, coal is such a huge deal. And, and it, I mean, they were having slightly apocalyptic stuff happen when I was there. So right. they had the pristine forest, ancient forests of Tasmania burnt to the ground. And, and at the same time, they were having massive floods in the north that were drowning cattle. Like, so it was really kind of biblical when I was there. Yeah. And I think they're just feeling it. And, it, and they're seeing that the politics hadn't, especially at that point, because this was pre-elections, pre elections are either have just happened or are coming mm -hmm. up very soon. Coming up, I think. Yeah. Which is weird if you hear this podcast in five years. Yeah, you're going, yes, is there an election in Australia? <laughs> <laughs> but they just had one. Like, what? The, and you're checking the news feed. <laughs> totally confused. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, that's fine. <laughs> I mean, they, they, they're generally regarded as, you know, being an irreverent, you know, culture, yeah. you know, laughing at anything, man. Back in the day, you know, I used to live there in 89 yeah. and, you know, yeah, they weren't like they were today at all then. I mean, they were just like, yeah, and nobody gives a damn, you know, and. Well, you had like Midnight Oil, who was mm. singing very wide awake songs about what was going on there and traveling everywhere to try to raise awareness. Um, Best live act still to this day in my life. Mm -hmm. Midnight Oil at some theater in L.A. in like 1989 or 90. Oh, Peter Garrett, man. <laughs> Just, you know, daddy long legs with those limbs flying around. That was awesome. And political. I was into political music, man. Oh, yeah, totally. I saw them at Cornell. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Two oh. years after you did or something like that. Yeah. No, but also like Aboriginal rights and stuff. And he went on yeah. to be a politician. He was a politician for many years, Peter Garrett, like you after Midnight Oil. Super cool. Where are they today? <laughs> Peter Garrett, Acid Rain. I miss you people. <laughs> you know? Acid Rain, Acid Rain. <laughs> That's right. If Prince was alive, there you go. He would be He'd be on board. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> oh. So one of the one of the really well respected climate scientists for the Red Cross Climate Center um, presented to a Development and Climate Days a side event of the COP in Poland about how important humor is in climate work, and I got to facilitate one of the um, activities in that, and it was 
you know, 400 people, 200, 400 people in the room, and this is, he, he's making a stand of like, we need this, guys, as resilience for us, as a way of communicating. So it's starting to, to get big traction, which is nice. We had somebody in the World Bank in my, my Singapore course, which was great, uh, um, infrastructure economist. He made this lovely observation about Robin Hood, like what, what a jerk Robin Hood was, because he's like, what do you think the lords are going to do the next day after they're up? They're going to go back and hit the people again? <laughs> like They didn't have insurance back then. <laughs> so you live in Germany. Yeah. You're a funny woman living in Germany. How's that working out for you? <laughs> Seriously, come on. Let's play in all the cliches. Like seriously, right? Um, What's it like? Seriously, awesome. yeah. funny American woman living in uh, in Germany. Yes. And yeah. how's this? <laughs> Sehr good. Sehr good. Ah. <laughs> Luckily, one of the places, the place that I run the course is called Cosmic Comedy, and it's actually one of the top English-speaking comedy uh, clubs in Europe. So that's handy. They're lovely people. So and they get what the course is doing. So that's great. But you like living here? Yeah, I love it. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, think about it, the history, it's one of the few places in living memory where you've had capitalism and communism right next to each other. People here have a sense of things can be different and better and let's talk about it from knowledge, mm. <laughs> you know what I mean, not just theoretically. Um, and you have whistleblowers and artists and filmmakers and stuff here, <laughs> so it's a great place, yeah. And just kind of an observation, like Germany really is the shining light in the world at the moment for sustainability and, you know, uh, not just getting rid of nuclear, but just all the stuff that they're doing for, uh, you know, uh, sustainable housing and subsidizing solar in this country, which is not known for its sun, but still, you know, they're doing amazing things with policy and with uh, the general perception of the, the population that, yeah, we got to do stuff, right? It's really... Um, but then it's not a very funny place. It's kind of like, oh, we have all this potential, <laughs> but they're Germans. Oh God. Yeah. No. All right. On that note, it might be time for wine. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Belina. Great to talk to you. Cool. That's fine, wasn't it? Yeah. I can never spend more than five minutes with Belina without laughing. I have many funny friends who do good work for a better future. But for Belina, humor is her roadmap for a better approach to dealing with the challenges that we all face. I'm left wondering why we haven't taken this road before. Humor is a powerful tool for change if we use it correctly. Belina is sweet and lovely, but behind her sunny personality is a powerful human with a pioneering vision. You really have to check out her <laughs> badly marketed book, How Improv Can Save the World and Me. And look forward to her next book about sustainable stand-up. Make sure you read them outdoors, in the wind, in the spirit of this podcast episode. That wraps up another episode of the Coolville Urbanism Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Koval Anderson. Thanks for listening. And you know, remember, it's your city. Take it back. <laughs>